Happy Friday, folks, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security news each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting September 1, 2014. Let's start the week's news with software updates. As usual, in the first week of the month on Thursday, Microsoft released their advanced notification post where they warn about next Tuesday's upcoming patches. According to the post, Microsoft plans on releasing four security bulletins, one of which they rate critical. The critical bulletin will fix uh, vulnerabilities in Internet Explorer, so you should definitely get that patch. Besides that, they also plan on fixing vulnerabilities in Windows, the .NET framework, and the Link server. So if you use any of those Microsoft products, be sure to pay attention next Tuesday for the patches. Also during the week, Mozilla released another version of Firefox. I believe it was Firefox 32. And besides fixing a number of vulnerabilities, including a use after free vulnerability that might be used in drive-by downloads, Mozilla also announced a new security feature. The feature is called Public Key Pinning, and in short, it ensures certificates your browser encounters at websites are really legitimate, allowing it to avoid man-in-the-middle attacks. So if you're a Firefox user, be sure to get that update. I hate to say it, but another week, another security breach. According to a Brian Krebs article, we learned that Home Depot may have suffered a big security breach. In his article, Brian Krebs said a number of banking sources had claimed that they detected a lot of fraudulent activity for credit cards that seemed to be used at Home Depot. Later in the week, we learned that perhaps this breach has affected many, many Home Depot stores. And the way they figured this out was by going to an underground card or form and paying attention to the latest batch of stolen credit cards Cards and what zip codes these credit cards belong to. And long story short, they found that about 98% of the credit cards match zip codes for all the Home Depot stores located in different states. Now, Home Depot hasn't confirmed this breach. Rather, they said they are investigating the possibility of the breach and will share more details soon. They also say that if there is a breach, consumers shouldn't have to worry because one, in the US, credit card agencies will cover this sort of fraud, and two, they'll offer free credit credit monitoring services if they have suffered a breach. Besides that, we really don't know anything about this breach yet. We don't know how it happened or, or how many credit cards the, the attackers stole, although Krebs suggests that it might be bigger than the target breach. I personally also suspect that point-of-sale malware was probably involved. In fact, it could have been the back-off malware that US CERT has been warning about that's affected thousands of other organizations as well. So what can you do as a consumer out there? Well, first of all, if you shop at Home Depot, you need to start monitoring your credit card usage to look for fraudulent charges. If you see any, be sure to report them. Also pay attention for letters from uh, Home Depot or your bank talking about how your credit card may have been stolen and get a new one if that's the case. As far as tips for retailers that take credit cards, there's a number of tips to beef up your security. Use layered defense with a unified threat management or next generation firewall. Uh, make sure to have DLP solutions that can track credit card data especially magnetic track data as it passes through your network. And finally, consider advanced threat solutions like APT Blocker to catch some of this evasive morphine malware that's used in these point of sale system attacks. So that's all I know now, but as the story continues to develop, I'll be sure to share updates in this video or in our blog. So that brings me to the last and biggest story this week, and unfortunately it's kind of a gross and creepy one. During last week's long U.S. holiday weekend, we learned that hackers out there had stolen a lot of celebrity pictures, including some very kind of private, you know, nude celebrity pictures from over a hundred different well-known celebrities. There's been a ton of news about this particular hack over the week with all kinds of different views on how it might happen. But what we essentially know is over the holiday weekend, a couple of uh, well-known sites like 4chan and some underground sites like Anon IB, these are image sharing sites and one is kind of a gross image sharing site, uh, had some users start sharing information about stolen 
a celebrity pictures hacked from cell phone backups in the cloud. At first it started with censored pictures where the guys were asking for money, but eventually hundreds of different pictures started to leak and got spread around, not just on these sites, but on very popular sites like Reddit. Now, no one really knows exactly how these hacks happen. There's a lot of theories. First of all, during the same time period, a Russian researcher released a tool called iBrute. This is a tool that takes advantage of the Find My Phone API uh, to allow for brute forcing of iCloud passwords. Many cloud services, like a lot of iCloud's uh, web services, throttle password entry, meaning if you do the wrong password five or ten times, it's going to lock you out temporarily to make sure brute forcers can't brute force those passwords. But the researcher found out that the Find My Phone app did not have this throttling in effect. So it could essentially use the API to allow for brute forcing of passwords. Now others say that this had nothing to do with the attack, but it's kind of coincidental that this tool was released on GitHub during the same time period. In any case, some other researchers have been following the posts that were on 4chan and Anon IB, and they found that essentially there's been this ring of cell phone selfie stealers that has been stealing, you know, phone information and iCloud information and hacking it for a long, long time. Very similar to the Matt Honan hack that happened long ago. And they found that these attackers use many different types of techniques to try to break into iCloud attacks. Anywhere from guessing the secrets you use to reset your password, to social engineering, to setting up remote access Trojans, to possibly brute forcing passwords. They also found that once they get your iCloud or Apple ID password, they have various commercial tools out there, like Elcomsoft sells a password recovery tool for iCloud backups that essentially allows you to use your iCloud password to pull the full backup file off of Apple's iCloud and get access to pictures that may not even be actively stored in iCloud. In either case, it's a very horrible thing to happen. It's kind of a, a very gross situation. I feel very bad for the celebrity. Uh, that are involved in this. And there's a lot of people talking about the whole nature of taking nude selfies and whether that's moral or not, but really that should not be considered at all. If you kind of replace this whole celebrity selfie incident with tax information you do online or banking information or, or confidential corporate data you might put on a file locker, the same thing could happen to anybody on the internet that uses the cloud. So really, what do we learn from this big incident? Well, there's a number of things and unfortunately there's no simple answer. Well, first of all, we really need to think about the cloud. Security pundits like me have always been kind of skeptical and worried about the cloud. The whole idea of putting your private data somewhere else is kind of scary. You know, certainly there's arguments that big companies have more resources to protect it, which may be true, but it may also be true that the companies don't bother protecting that data as much because it's not as personal to the company as it is to you. So this brings up the whole idea again of is it safe to put really sensitive information in the cloud? Personally, I think the cloud is very useful. There's a lot of great things that, that we can do in the cloud. I like the fact that some of my iPhone photos are backed up in the cloud, but luckily for me, my iPhone photos aren't really that sensitive, so I'm not worried about them. I personally would never put very sensitive or confidential data in a cloud service if I could avoid it. Nonetheless, with the internet of everything or the internet of things, more and more devices are putting stuff in the cloud without us knowing, so it may not be something we can really avoid. Another big thing in this story is passwords. You're probably getting sick of us talking about passwords, but it's very, very important until there's some sort of alternative to use very strong passwords. Use a different password everywhere. Use password managers. In all of these targeted attacks, you know, the attackers had to somehow get the password. And while a uh, strong password is not going to save you from phishing if you give someone your password, it can save you from any sort of brute force technique where an attacker, you know, cracks a short password. So use strong passwords. Another topic this brings up is two-factor authentication, of which I'm a strong believer. To me, the solution to this password and breach problem is having two-token authentication. We can't get rid of passwords. That will always be one form of authentication. But if we use two-token authentication, it will make it that much harder for a bad guy to break into our accounts. And by the way, while I think it's okay to have biometrics as a second token in this two-token authentication, I'm not a huge believer in biometrics. And the main reason 
is, even though it's harder for someone to copy your biometric information, if they can fake your fingerprint, once they have it, they have it forever. There's no way for you to change your fingerprints to something new if it's ever stolen in some way. Now, a lot of these celebrity pictures seem to be coming from iCloud or iDevices. Uh, that doesn't mean that this ring of attackers weren't targeting Android phones and Windows phones as well. But for whatever reason, either celebrities use iPhones more often, or there's something uh, critical about iCloud that makes it easier to hack. Whatever the case is, most of these attacks seem to be coming from Apple's iCloud. Now, Apple has responded to this hack and said they've been investigating it for over 40 hours, and they say that there's no breach in their network. And that, by the way, is very carefully worded. While I agree that an attacker hasn't broken into their network, they did probably have some vulnerabilities that made it easier for the bad guy to steal stuff from iCloud. One of those vulnerabilities could have been this iBrute application, which Apple has since quietly patched. Uh, you can no longer actually try to brute force via and find my phone. Another situation was their own two-token authentication. While they've had this, and it's good that they have two-token authentication, researchers have verified that it only works on certain iCloud uh, functionality. Some iCloud functionality, like getting cloud backups, does not require two-token authentication, so that's kind of scary. Finally, on some of the 4chan and Anon IB posts, uh, they talked about how they could actually figure out your, your Apple email address by visiting visiting a certain link. If you visit a certain uh, Apple URL with an email address, it actually returns enough information for you to know if it's valid or not. So it does seem there are some iCloud weaknesses that helped hackers do this. So again, your tips are avoid putting your confidential information in the cloud, use a strong password, and use two-token authentication. Turn it on for every web service that offers it. I really highly recommend it. We'll continue to follow this particular story to see how it turns out or if there's any more news, but I really hope the authorities catch these bad guys. So that's it for this week. I hope it was interesting and educational. As always, a ton of other stories out there, so be sure to check out the blog post associated with this video where you'll find a reference section to all those other stories. And this, of course, is hosted at the WatchGuard Security Center blog. I hope you've subscribed to it. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. By the way, if you've heard some music in the background as I've done this video, right now the Seattle Seahawks are doing the big uh, NFL kickoff event where Pharrell and Soundgarden are playing live just across the street from our offices. So I'll post a little video of that so you can see the action at the end of this video. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.